Hello everyone, here on Worth a Shot, we are so excited to have Dr. Lucana Karkanis from the Allergy and Immunology Associates of South Texas. So thank you so much, Dr. Karkanis, for joining us today. Thank you, Meher, for giving me this opportunity. I'm happy to answer questions and um, we can answer uh, any questions that um, your uh, followers have regarding the JNJ vaccine and the pandemic. Thank you so much. So Dr. Karkanis, this recent pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, has really sparked a lot of vaccine hesitancy in the community. Um, so what would you say to people who are feeling hesitant about receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? And how do we know that it's safe and effective for us to receive? So let me give you a little background. On um, April 12th, the FDA put a temporary pause on Johnson & Johnson vaccinations in the US. And that was because they noticed that about six cases of a certain blood clotting condition called TTS, thrombocytic um, thrombosis syndrome had been reported. Um, and then subsequently they studied 15 cases actually, but you have to keep in mind that uh, almost 7 million doses of that Johnson & Johnson vaccine had been given out and they noted six cases of this condition that causes headaches and basically causes blood clots in a particular uh, venous sinus in the brain along with a drop in a blood cell called platelets. Okay, that's what this medical condition is. It is exceedingly rare, but to be on the safe side, because the US FDA is so very vigilant, they put a pause and they took about two weeks to study what was going on. And this is what they found. In actual COVID infection, you can have the same condition happen, but at much higher rates, almost over 100,000 cases of this every million COVID infections, okay? So if you're worried about getting this, you should worry more about staying non-immunized because if you catch COVID infection, your chances of getting this are 100,000 times higher than any vaccine. You can see this condition with smokers, about 2,000 in a million smokers get it. You can see it in women who take birth control pills, about 500 to 1,000 in a million will get it. Um, you can, you, they did see some cases with the AstraZeneca vaccine, but again, four in a million. And with the Johnson & Johnson, it was six in seven million, okay? So very, very rare overall. When they studied them, they found that the majority of people affected were women, and they were in the 18 to 59 age group. So the elderly who took the vaccine, none of them had it. Um, there didn't seem to be any underlying cause to specify that there's a particular group to avoid this vaccine in. Um, and it was usually seen about six to 15 days after that these people developed very severe headaches. That was the first case. They went and looked at the other two vaccines that we have in the US, the Pfizer and Moderna, and they did not see any of this TTS, no blood clots with no platelets after either of those mRNA vaccines. And after looking at these numbers where, you know, in the general population, one to five in a million get it. And after the vaccine, six in seven million got it. It was deemed that this vaccine is safe because it seemed like, yes, there were a few rare cases, but the benefit of the vaccine outweighs the risk because if we leave the population unimmunized, then about 150,000 people in every million might get this from COVID infection. And that's why on uh, April 23, they lifted the pause because they felt confident that it was safe and effective and the benefits outweigh the potential risks. So I think the main me message to people who are feeling hesitant is, you know, it's higher risk to stay unimmunized. If you have a choice of taking a different vaccine that's readily available and you are hesitant about the J&J &J vaccine, at least take the other vaccine that's available. But if no other COVID vaccine is readily available to you, then you are taking a huge gamble by staying unimmunized because if you catch COVID infection, your chances of this complication or myriad other complications are much higher. So don't be scared of taking this vaccine. It's overall a very safe vaccine and there is nothing that has no side effects. Infections have side effects, medications have side effects. 
And guess what? If you catch COVID, the treatments that you will get will have way worse side effects. So don't be hesitant about this vaccine. It is a very safe vaccine. If you already took this vaccine and you did not have any complications, you're in the clear. You don't need to worry. You're one of the several million lucky people who did not get it because only six and seven million really had this rare side effect. Uh, and I think that's my reason to endorse to you to make a decision that's safe for yourself. Um, don't take a risk with catching the infection. Make an informed decision because nothing in life is risk-free and this risk seems to be very, very low. And we do know how to recognize it. We do know how to treat you if something happens. Thank you, Dr. Karkanis. This gives us a really comprehensive overview of the benefits versus the risks of the J&J &J vaccine and the benefits clearly outweigh those risks. Thank you. So Dr. Karkanis, can you please walk us through potential causes for this adverse effect caused by the J&J &J vaccine? Did all the people affected have a similar underlying condition? So uh, basically they noticed that it was young women, 18 to 59 or so years old, um, but there were no common risk factors. Some of them had obesity, some of them were on birth control pills, um, but there was no common risk factor that all of them had. So this seems to be a one-off rare complication that could happen. Um, but the majority of women in that age group, if they catch COVID, they're more likely to have that very same complication, like a thousand times more likely. So there is not anything that one should particularly avoid. In general, smoking is not a good idea. But other than that, there is no real risk factor that we can weed out. Thank you, Dr. Karakhanis. So many people in the community have been wondering what steps are we taking as a globe and in the United States too to ensure vaccine equity? We've heard a lot about the vaccine sharing effort, COVAX. So can you please tell us more about that and other efforts? So COVAX is led by um, WHO and UNICEF and two other organizations, Gavi and CEPI, which is the Collaboration for Equity. Um, and then in January, after um, the current President Biden assumed office, the United States joined COVAX and they, in February, we have donated almost $2 billion to the vaccine efforts with COVAX. And their main goal is to provide vaccines that will um, be able to immunize at least 20% of the population in all the member countries. So um, we have given about $2 billion already um, with the recent rise in cases in India that we are seeing over the past couple of weeks where the situation is getting really bad. Um, United States has donated supplies uh, for vaccine manufacturing and, and then supplies for treatment, including PPE kits, oxygen and things like that, medications like remdesivir. So even outside of vaccine, um, we are doing a lot to um, improve the world's community because everybody is suffering from the pandemic. Dr. Karakanis, it's so interesting that some sort of widespread outbreak seems to occur about every 100 years, like the flu pandemic in 1918. Do you think that there are any potential causes for this pattern, or is it just a coincidence? And what similarities have we seen in viruses that tend to cause large epidemics or outbreaks? So um, there doesn't seem to be a biological cause why it happens every hundred years or so, but it is true that in, a, in 1918, there was the flu pandemic, which is called the Spanish flu pandemic. And then in 2020, 2019, 2020, we had the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, there, it seems to be that it happens after many, many decades, which is a good thing. We don't want this happening all the time. Um, but there's not a biological reason why it's every 100 years. Now, what we do know is that these viruses share some common features, okay? They are highly contagious, so they can spread very easily from a um, pre-infected or symptomatic person to a normal person. So they're highly contagious, doesn't take a lot to spread, a cough or a sneeze, 
um, is enough to spread those droplets with the viral particles. So they are all respiratory. They um, are not universally fatal. So they don't kill each and every person that they infect. And this is in a way good for the virus because if the virus wants to survive, it needs the hosts to live long enough to spread it to more hosts. So if we ever were to have a viral infection that killed almost everybody that it infected, the infection would die out pretty soon because very soon all the infected hosts would die and then the virus would not be able to spread because it could die along with this host. So those are the two common things is that it's highly contagious and people who get it, some of them survive and they spread it on to others. Now, the third thing to keep in mind is these viruses, they have animal reservoirs. So even if we were to uh, immunize every human being in this world, these viruses can live in other animals that we cannot always immunize. So for example, flu can live in chickens and birds and pigs, um, and coronavirus can live in rodents like ferrets and minks and pangolins, and it can live in bats. And, we are never going to be able to eradicate it from the wild animal reservoirs in the forests of the world. So those are the common things to remember. Very contagious, they let the host survive. So people survive after getting infected and who survives spread it to other people and then they can survive in animals as well. Thank you, Dr. Karkanis. So do you think that there is anything we as a global society can do to decrease transmission of infection from animals to humans to potentially avert large scale epidemics? So the one thing that has stood out very pointedly after the coronavirus pandemic is that we need to lock down on and decrease of exotic animal hunting and sale, because that is where we think this happened. It, it came, the coronavirus came from bats to an intermediary called a pangolin, and it happened um, in a market that was known for exotic animal hunting and sale. So that needs to be more tightly regulated and possibly banned. It is banned in several countries, but bans are not easy to enforce in different countries. And then we also need to improve cooperation between countries in terms of um, sharing information, sharing resources, um, and learning that we are truly a global community. It's not one country that is to blame and it's not one country that will do well, you know? To put it mildly, that it's not ever going to completely disappear from one single country because eventually people are going to travel. You cannot shut down your borders and lock in people forever. So ultimately people are going to travel in and out of every country in this world um, because of globalization. And so you cannot keep the virus constrained in one corner of the world and ignore those people over there. We truly need to share and help each other out with information and resources. Otherwise it will keep spreading every time we ignore a part of the world. That's where the levels will go up. Dr. Karkhan is up. We've seen a lot of promise with the new mRNA technology uh, with the Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. So what diseases do you think that this technology can be used to target in the future? So it was already being studied for um, and probably will now get a huge boost to be studied for HIV and malaria. And there is a, uh, it was being studied for rabies so it's going to get a huge boost for those diseases because um, we have to keep in mind, we are focusing on the pandemic now for over a year, but HIV, malaria, these diseases still kill millions of people in parts of the world. And that's where I see the promise of the mRNA vaccine. We could also potentially make a very effective flu vaccine because the flu vaccine that we have right now is not that effective, it's good enough to prevent pandemics, but it still is only about 50% effective. So imagine if we could have a 95% effective flu vaccine, that would be great too. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Uh, Dr. Karkanis, we've heard about monoclonal antibodies that were approved for treatment of COVID-19. Can you please explain their role in targeting and treating COVID-19 illness? and whether they result in long-lasting immunity or whether they can be applied to the treatment of other diseases as well. 
So monoclonal antibodies are like a um, ready-made super effective antidote. Um, in this case, they are an antidote to the spike protein of the coronavirus. And the spike protein is the part of the virus that the virus needs to infect us. So when the virus enters our body, the spike protein on the outside is what anchors the virus to our cells and that's how the virus enters our cells. So these monoclonal antibodies in the US, they're made by two companies, Regeneron and Lilly. They're both pharmaceutical companies. They basically destroy those spike proteins. Now, since the spike proteins help the virus early on during entry, that's why for these monoclonal antibodies to help, they have to be given early on. They have to be given in the initial few days of infection. You cannot wait till you are very sick then it doesn't help because the virus has already entered the cells and the spike protein has already done its job. It does not provide long lasting immunity because it is a protein that's ready made and it will just fight off the spike protein while it lasts. So we think it lasts about four to six weeks and in about 90 days, most of the monoclonal antibody is gone from our system. So the monoclonal antibody right now available, they help fight just COVID we could develop monoclonal antibodies for other diseases, but these won't help with anything else. They have to be given early and they are temporary. So even if you got monoclonal antibodies to treat your COVID infection, you still need to go get the vaccine so that your body can develop its own long lasting immunity. The monoclonal antibody does not provide that training to your immune system. Thank you, Dr. Karkanis. So I know that so many young people like me have been just feeling discouraged about the pandemic, feeling like there isn't any hope left. So what would you say to um, people, especially young people like me who are just feeling um, so depressed about everything that's going on right now and feeling like um, just there isn't, that there isn't any hope for things to get better? So I would say keep, keep hope. We still have hope. It may seem like forever and uh, it's understandable, you know, if it was your senior year and you missed prom, you missed your graduation party, if it was your freshman year in college and you couldn't live on campus, uh, things like that can seem very, very significant when they're actually happening. But keep in mind, one year, two years, even five years is a very small blip. Hopefully we are all going to have long, long lives. And these few years are really nothing in the long run of our lives. One fine day we will look back on them and just think, oh, it was just a year or two years that I could not do certain activities. So don't lose hope. There is hope out there. Um, we may find a new lifestyle. Some things may be different, but there are lots of things to look forward to. We are seeing excellent advances in a lot of fields because of the pandemic, because we are trying to fight the pandemic, not just medical, but information technology and um, the, the whole era of virtual work and virtual education. And we are seeing a lot of progress in other fields too. So there is definitely hope out there. And when you look back on it, hopefully one day, you won't even remember much about it and you'll be able to tell your, your peers and uh, people younger to you that you lived through one or two years. So it, it, there's hope out there. Don't lose hope. This will, this will change and we will get back to doing a lot of activities that we miss. Thank you, Dr. Karkana. This is such an inspiring message for the community, especially for young people like me. So um, many of us have heard about the promising news from the Pfizer trial for kids um, age 12 to 15. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about that? So yes, so Pfizer has collected enough data in the 12 to 15 year olds and submitted it to the FDA. And so hopefully the FDA will extend their authorization um, to give the Pfizer vaccine to 12 and above. They saw great results. The trials basically showed that no kids in the vaccine arm got COVID as opposed to several in the placebo arm did get COVID. Um, and it was very safe. They did not see any difference in the adverse effects. The common ones were still what grown-ups get, the mild body aches, the mild sore arm, maybe a little bit of chills and nausea for a day or so. Um, and so the expectation is that any day now, the FDA will give Pfizer the green signal 
and then um, an adolescents like you age 12 to 15 will be able to get the vaccine as well and hopefully that will help us go back to school in person go back to college in person and have lots of things look different in the fall mm -hmm. So is it um, the same vaccine that was tested in kids or was it a different vaccine? It's the exact same vaccine, the exact same Pfizer vaccine and the exact same dose that was tested. Mm -hmm. So um, it looks like it will work very well. Yeah, definitely. I think this is like such amazing uh, news, especially for kids like me who've been anxiously waiting uh, for, the, for their vaccine. Yes, yes. And I encourage everybody to get it. And if you know somebody that's in the age group 12 to 15, once it's approved, please go encourage them to go get it as well. Dr. Karkanis, how do you see the world bouncing back from this pandemic? And from a public health perspective, um, how do you think day-to-day -day life will change? So I think, like I mentioned before, we will bounce back. Our lives may look different. So I think a lot of careers went remote and will probably stay remote because there are advantages to not having to commute, not having to spend on gas, the employer not having to rent out a huge office and pay huge utility bills. And so some people will find that they work better and are more productive um, working from home even when there is not a pandemic. And that is a good thing. That is a sign of progress. Um, some people will find that they have to be a little more cautious with travel, especially international travel, um, and that's not a bad thing either. Once travel opens up, if we are able to get a um, tighter hold on levels worldwide, then um, I think some of us will still have to exercise a little bit of caution. You have to keep in mind, COVID, the virus, is going to stick around. So. Um, we will learn to control it, keep a tight rein on it, immunize enough people that it won't cause the, the large scale deaths and morbidities that it is causing right now. Um, I think a lot of us will find that not only did we not catch COVID, but because we were wearing a mask, we did not catch flu and we did not even catch a common cold and we did not catch RSV. And so we may choose to wear masks every flu season. We may choose to wear a mask when respiratory infections are high because guess what, they work, they prevent viral spread. So I think in some ways the world will look a little different, but it will bounce back. We will find a new kind of lifestyle, a new normal, and we will still be able to leave, live fruitful lives. Thank you, Dr. Karkanis. So this question is an especially is an especially important one for young people like me who are interested in medicine. So what would you say to young people who are interested in medicine, very passionate about public health, but feel discouraged because of, of the pandemic? My main message would be we need youngsters like you in medicine and public health now more than ever because this has shown us what we can do as a race if we really put our minds to it. I mean, we developed vaccines um, by putting our minds to it, by putting our resources to it um, quicker than we've ever done before. We've developed drugs quicker than we've ever done before and monoclonal antibodies. And so we need new talent more than ever. Now, keep in mind, um, don't go into medicine or public health because you want to make money. Yes, most doctors make a decent living and earn a decent salary, but there are other careers where you can make decent salaries too that are not as demanding. It is a demanding profession, but if you enjoy what you do, which I do very much, if you enjoy uh, taking care of people, interacting with people and making a difference in their lives, then this profession is the one that will give you the most job satisfaction. It's the one where you will find that you can really make a difference. So don't get discouraged, though it may seem like it's an uphill battle, there is a time when you will find that you enjoy what you do and then there is no job better than this one. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karkhanis. This was so amazing, so inspiring, so informative for the community. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you very much for this opportunity again. And um, if anybody has any questions that uh, were left out, please reach out to me and I would be happy to answer them.